Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, next, we're going to look at the subject of space weather, where we are fortunate to have some of the most prominent authorities in the field here with us today. To lead this panel, please welcome Dr. Daniel Banker, Baker, the Director of Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado. Dr. Baker, take it away. Thank you. If I could have the first slide, please. Modern uh, societies have embedded our planet Earth in a cyber electric cocoon. This extends from beneath the uh, ocean surface to the far reaches of space. This affects our modern society in many, many ways. We have a much more connected society now than we did a decade ago, and a decade from now, it's hard to imagine how connected we're going to be. We know that the sun and effects from the sun can affect these technological systems in complex ways. And our panel today is going to talk about some of these effects, but more importantly, perhaps, about the policy implications and the research and uh, efforts that need to be expended in order for us to deal with space weather. Space weather can be moderate, it can be mild, or it can be extreme, as weather on Earth is. We have uh, on the panel today people representing um, academia, also industry, and um, government, both from a standpoint of operations as well as policy. I'm not going to give detailed uh, bios for the, uh, the various panel members. They are uh, in your book, but we will have each of the speakers uh, in turn. I'll give brief introductions of them. I'd like to uh, just point out that the uh, last decade or so has seen tremendous progress in the uh, various aspects of space weather, both our understanding of space weather as a, a driving force for uh, technological systems, but also uh, a great uh, advance in understanding the, um, the way that our government uh, agencies need to work together and the way that uh, all the different components of society need to appreciate more deeply what space weather can mean to that particular sector. If I could have the next slide, please. I was privileged to uh, chair for the National Academies. Next slide, please. Oh, we've got the control. Okay, 
I'll trust my colleagues to control this here. <laughs> um, I thought it was a space weather event that occurred, but. Um, they, they have it right soon. About a decade ago, uh, I had the privilege of, uh, of chairing for the National Academies a, um, a meeting where we brought together people from the power industry, from the global positioning system, from aviation, military, space, and so forth to really look at the consequences of severe space weather. This led to a report, the cover of which you see here on the screen, and this report has probably had more staying power than many National Academy studies. It has influenced, I think, many other uh, countries and many other sectors of, uh, of such as reinsurance and other uh, agencies to look at the possible impacts of space weather. And uh, we're going to talk more about that and some of the fleshing out of that that has occurred over the time since this report was issued, as I say, in about 2008. If I could have the next slide, my colleagues. <laughs> uh, and I also was privileged uh, to chair for the National Academies uh, the relatively recent, uh, now it's not so recent, a few years ago, but it's the decadal survey. The decadal surveys are regarded as one of the um, most important products that come from the National Academies. It uh, uses the, the uh, force of the entire community to look at what's important, what needs to be done in a given area. And in solar and space physics, heliophysics as it's known in NASA, this report of course studied deeply the science that needed to be carried out over the next uh, 10 years or so. But an important component of this, and perhaps we exceeded our authority a little bit in doing this, but we also looked at how the Department of Defense, NOAA, and the science agencies, NASA, the National Science Foundation, and so forth, ought to be working together to understand space weather and space climate. And in order to uh, carry that uh, forward, there were several points that were made. The need for a truly operational space weather system, that this is not only national but international uh, issue. The agency's roles and responsibilities were addressed to a degree. And the mission architecture, not in detail, but again, uh, broadly, what do we need to observe and how do we need to observe it? And then the uh, urging that a truly multi-agency approach be taken. And so uh, to, uh, address these points, to flesh them out, and to get us to a point where we're all uh, in the audience here on the same page about a lot of these things. We have four distinguished persons. First, I'm going to introduce Bill Murtaugh. Bill Murtaugh is currently the, uh, serves as the program coordinator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder. He recently uh, completed a two-year assignment at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as Assistant Director for Space Weather, Energy, and Environment. So Bill, please, Bill, please take it away. <laughs> Great, Dan, thanks very much. Well, we were sitting in the uh, speaker writing room a few minutes ago, and I asked my colleagues here on the panel, I asked, how many people do you guys think in this audience knew that the White House released a national strategy and action plan and an executive order all in the last two years on space weather. And they said, good question, why don't you ask the audience? So just to show our hands, how many people are aware that the White House did actually release strategy, action plan, and executive order on space weather? Good, good, good to know. It looks like about 50%. I told my uh, mem panel members here it would influence my, my uh, presentation knowing just that. <laughs> The White House has been engaged and interested in space weather five, six, seven years ago, and many others, and, and I'll focus a little bit on, on some of the other activities inside the Beltway here in just a few minutes. But it's largely because Dan mentioned the vulnerability of critical infrastructure for everything, the critical infrastructure that we rely on for everything we do today. When you ask that question, what is it like? What would it be like in this nation should we lose GPS for a couple of hours or a day? What would it be like if we lose some of those satellites we rely on for so much of what we do today? And perhaps worst of all, if we shut the power down in a large chunk of this country for an extended period of time, what is the impact on the nation? Well, of course, what I'm highlighting here is all the various technologies vulnerable to space weather, and the loss of any one of these is a critical impact on our nation, or even our ability to govern this nation. Well, it's recognized at the White House. Uh, and not just the individual sectors themselves, but of course the interdependency 
between all these sectors, losing one and the consequence and the rest, it would be catastrophic to the nation. So recognizing that and recognizing there was a lot we didn't know, but we could not take the chance anymore. We had to step in and do something. And in, in the summer of 2014, the decision was made that the, we would embark on a national strategy and action plan to address the, uh, the space weather uh, issue. A task force was put together involving, someone asked me, how, uh, who are the stakeholders for space weather? So we know who to put on this task force. I said, well, everybody, given the impacts of space, the diverse impacts of space weather. But we put together a task force with 20 departments and, and agencies to do just that, develop the strategy and action plan. And in October 2015, the strategy and action plan was released. The strategy was a very general, overarching document of about 12, 13 pages. But the action plan, more important, identified 99 different actions necessary for this nation to build resilience against this risk of space weather. It identified the actions necessary, the agencies responsible, and a timeline for implementation. By October, one year later, we put the hammer on this. The strategy and action plan does not have force of law, but put an executive action behind it. We did that, and the president signed executive action on an executive order on space weather in 2016. But I just wanted to highlight, just to, to give everyone a sense for how uh, this issue of space weather is being addressed across the highest levels of government, now, just some other things that are happening. Senate Bill 141, it's the Space Weather Research and Forecasting Act, was introduced in the new Congress in January of this year. And they've, with the folks and uh, colleagues on the Hill, working very well together with the White House, recognized that the very good activities outlined, identified in the action plan, should be legislated. So much of what you will see in that action plan is contained in Senate Bill 141 that is being worked now, and it's bipartisan support, which we all know is critical. The bill, the bill was uh, introduced by um, Senator Peters, but has uh, support from Senator, around Senator Gardner here, Republican in Colorado, Senator Wicker, Republican from Mississippi, and Cory Booker, the Democrat from New Jersey. So bipartisan support. Also happening, that FERC, the Federal Energy Reliability Corporation, established standards very recently in September of 2016, and that was a game changer. Prior to that, the electric power industry, private industry across this nation, had the responsibility of doing what they thought was necessary to protect against geomagnetic storms. Some thought lots of important actions were necessary, others said maybe not so much. This whole grid is interconnected. We needed some kind of consistency uh, across this industry. FERC stepped in and mandated it. So that's happening now. The DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, Strategic National Risk Assessment. In there, you will find the most significant con impact, potential impacts on our nation and from the natural uh, perspective, hurricanes or, or earthquakes, volcanoes. Now you see space weather included in there. And some other things, just briefly, fixing American surface transportation, FASTX, which largely focuses on transportation but does include uh, an a important geomagnetic disturbance, disturbance piece, and that is to store strategically located spare power transformers to reduce the vulnerability of GMD on military installations and other uh, critical installations. And finally, Senate Bill 2943, the National Defense Authorization Act, you will see right in there lots of references to not just space weather and GMD, geomagnetic disturbances, but EMP, electromagnetic pulse, they're lumped together. So not just space weather for sp specific actions, but other activities on the way inside the beltway where space weather is uh, folded in. So I'll just finish with, with, with a me uh, my message here. You know, space weather obviously can disrupt the technology that does form the very backbone of, of, of this nation. So what we want to do, those, those key messages, we've got to have these capabilities, the capability to predict and observe and detect a space weather event. We have to have the plans and programs necessary to alert the public. As the, having the information is one thing, getting it out to the right people at the right time or as accurate as possible is critical for the, to enable the mitigating actions necessary. Protection and mitigation plans and protocols, working very closely with Department of Homeland Security and FEMA, we are working on this to have that, the protection and mitigation plans in place. And of course, if a big Carrington-like space weather event does occur, we have to deal with the consequences, so we must have that ability to respond and recover from the effects of an extreme space weather event. And finally, I, I, I leave you with this. We, we, when we embarked on this initiative at the White House, 
it was obviously the federal government working it. It could not be done, it could not be an all of government approach. It had to be an all of community approach. When we're working with the power grid, to get the power grid to do the necessary things, the power grid is not federal government, it is, it is privately owned. And of course, many of you here operating the satellites, privately owned sat satellites, we had to make this a whole of community approach. And we continued to do that with many of our initiatives. Recently, we, we released uh, some of the documents that were called for in the action plan without on the federal register to get, to, to get, uh, to get uh, input from the community. So many of the experts that we need the input from reside, of course, in academia and industry. We did what we had to do over the last couple of years to address this growing concern. It is now critical in the new administration, the new Congress, that we all work together to sustain that engagement to get things done necessary to build resilience against the threat of space weather to this nation. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <coughs> um, I'd like to now call on Scott Faust, who's Vice President of Research for Lockheed Martin Space Systems. And in that role, he leads the Advanced Technology Center, which is developing technology for next generation and generation after next space systems. Scott? Thanks, Dan. And uh, first, thanks for inviting me to participate in the panel. <coughs> you know, Lockheed Martin is always excited to be an active participant in this great event. So, and, and especially on this topic, space weather is one we've been involved in for so quite some time, both from a scientific perspective with instruments like IRIS and AIA, and, and now an operational perspective with SUVI that's currently flying on Gozar. We'll hear more about later. As I think about space weather, I'm reminded of an interaction I had with uh, a military commander a few years ago when we were talking about how, what kind of information we need. He goes, I don't need to know what the weather is. I need to know how the weather is going to affect my mission. <laughs> and um, in the context of space weather, that means in addition to being able to forecast the, 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 the effects, the conditions, we must also be able to forecast the impact on critical infrastructure, mission critical systems. So for me, you know, I view this as a very complex systems in modeling problem. And in order for us to fully understand these complex interactions, it will require both empirical modeling and modeling from first principles. So in addition to developing these instruments we're gonna hear about today that are focused on the sun, we also need to be focused on, on observing the both the Earth-Sun interactions, but also all the way down to these kind of critical elements, whether it's the, P, the you know, GPS, PNT the systems or the power grid. And these are very complex systems, very hard to model. From an industry perspective, thank you. From an industry perspective, we are very interested in developing affordable solutions that support the needs for all of these key stakeholders. And here I just kind of at a very high level, we think about kind of military, civil, civil including commercial, commerce, but also bridging from the science to the operations side. And in order to do that, we need to develop a comprehensive collection of system models that are gonna be able to help us understand all these complex interactions and, and the instruments that provide the data to shape and feed those models. And we have to be creative in finding affordable and sustainable approaches to all this. You know, we can't start down a path that just is not sustainable from a cost perspective. For instance, and, and we need to make sure that at any time we're getting the right data. For instance, we, my group, and I, I lead a very interesting uh, space science group that's focused on heliophysics, believe it's critical that we, we get to the point where we can collect data off, the, off of the Earth-Sun line but in order to do that, we've got, we've got to come up with some creative solutions to make it affordable. Um, this next slide just shows some kind of estimated direct and indirect costs of space weather, as well as the fact that um, the direct effects actually vary with, with location on Earth. But the reality is because of kind of the international nature of, com of commerce today, the effects are spread in internationally. And, and in the world of just-in-time manufacturing, you can see the, uh, you can just not manufacturing, these effects may be surprising, quick, and serious. You can't build cars without all the parts. So while we know all the, so while we know, all, all know the effects are real, I don't believe yet we understand the full impact of these effects. Now this next chart is just to show how different parts of the globe can be affect, 
affected by global act by solar activity but as our society becomes more dependent on technology and as this leads to more global interactions you will you will experience the effects of space weather even when you're in good locations and you've done good local planning there are a lot again there are lots of complex dynamic models at play here so what do you do about all this stuff so from our perspective and i you know i i I resonate with what Bill talked about. It's got to be a full community approach. It's got to be an international co collaboration, and we want that collaboration working on multiple fronts. First, we need to do what we can on, on doing a better job of quantifying the impacts of the space weather. The society, com commerce, military operations. As the military tries to move to more highly coordinated, precise operations, the effects of space weather could be devastating on some of those operations. Um, we also just see the need for um, computational test beds. We need to create these kind of high performance computing where we can bring the uh, models together and see the tight inter interaction between the models and the data. We'll see the data drive the models. We will see the models drive the need for new observations. And though these test and, and through these test beds, we will be building what I think is very important, a strong database case on the impact of space weather. For the research community, we need to be focused on creating an environment where we that research community can have easy access to the data. Um, if we do that, I expect we'll see an accelerating effect on the development of these models, but that's going to be challenging. For instance, as we try to model the infrastructure and start talking about the vulnerabilities, this is obviously incredibly sensitive data. So this is, these are gonna be some of the challenges we have to, have to deal with as we try to collect the data, develop the models, and, and make them available to a broader community. Also, as we move to the operational side, um, and as we can, we need to consider how to make this approach affordable. So we may need to be thinking about new business models for, for providing value-added services. Um, maybe that will become very domain specific or user specific. And finally, the biggest challenge we have, which is I think what we'll be talking a lot about today, is we need to grow our observation capability. In a world of very constrained resources, we need to be creative and smart. We need to find affordable ways to observe from other few viewpoints like, like an L5, which creates some data retrieval challenges just because of the distance, and we'll have to find other ways to create effective access to the data with that with low bandwidth situ communication. We also need to be smart and look for opportunities to improve our observation capability. For instance, we could consider adding a different instrument that goes TU, you know, because if, if we, such as a compact mag magnetograph. Um, and, and one of the things that I know my lab is always focused on, we've got to find ways to make the, all these instruments smaller and more affordable. So if I were to leave you with one major thought, it's that we need a community focus on developing a collection of system models that could become the basis for future investments in systems, as Bill described. So <coughs> thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, in atmospheric science, it's proven very important to have national centers devoted to a study of the problems. And we are very pleased to have Scott McIntosh here as the director of the High Altitude Observatory and associate director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Scott? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, move on. So I'm very much concerned with um, space weather. Space weather, as far as I can see it from a research perspective, is a series of coin flips. What level of coin flipping is acceptable to you in your operational domain? From a research domain, we don't know when the sun's going to erupt. Of course, that's the $50 trillion question. We also don't know how severe that eruption will be. Many of these things are just informed guesswork. Will there be a flare? Will there be a coronal mass ejection? And will the two of them come hand in hand? We don't know. What, when the disturbance leaves the sun, what orientation will it have? Because that orientation is then critical to how it couples to the Earth's system and can be either disruptive or just bounce off. You know, what does that disturbance travel through? There's 93 million miles between the sun and the Earth. That's a very complex environment that's changing. It is not a benign vacuum. How do you characterize that flight path? Also, 
even if you could characterize the magnetic field orientation, I hate to be Debbie Downer, <laughs> but even if you could characterize that big magnetic tumbleweed that started to rumble through the solar system, how do you know how it evolves as it rumbles through space? So you see there's a lot of decision points here. There's a lot of observational decision points. There's a lot of research places where we can make significant improvement. And I think in some of these avenues, there are. And of course, for uh, Dr. Volt to my right here, one of the important things, of course, is how long does it take? What impact is it going to have? It's very much like a space hurricane. Impact, strength, and time of arrival are all critical. But for a CME or a solar disturbance, of course, this high aspect of polarization is a very tricky one because it's, it's like almost like finding a unicorn. It's very, very tricky to measure and extremely difficult to characterize. So that's the coin flips. But what if I told you that some of these things are not what you expect? So solar flares and coronal mass ejections are not the intrinsically unpredictable things that we've been brought up to think that they are. For example, if you're looking at extreme geomagnetic storms, did you know that they tend to occur in the weakest solar cycle? Did you also know that they very, very rarely occur, occur at the peak of solar cycles? Not many people know that. I could do that in a voice, but there's not many Brits in the audience that would get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the current solar cycle is the weakest in a century. <coughs> cycle, cycle 25, or at least the initial traces of it that we expect to see in the next decade, may be even half the amplitude of that. Well, that may mean that there's fewer CMEs and flares actually in a kind of bass back, <laughs> I've got to say it, <laughs> in a kind of backward sense, <laughs> that actually appears to be increasing the probability of a major storm. So we have to be aware. The observations themselves are pointing to the fact that the sun has seasons. The sun's hemispheres go through episodes of enhanced activity over the course of about 11 months. We're just beginning to figure this out. And if you look at the movie that's playing over and over again in the bottom right hand corner, it seems to be to do with global scale, I'll put it in quotes, planetary waves that are running around the sun's interior. All of the sun's magnetic activity seems to be tied to them. The flares and CMEs seem to be tied to those waves. To be able to characterize those things properly, and I think if you want to draw analog or analogy to terrestrial weather and the advances that were made 60 years ago that Dan alluded to, we need to get out of the sun or flying. And in fact, I'll push the boat even further that L5 isn't sufficient to fully characterize the problem. We need to go to an Earth observing like system for the sun. Mm -hmm. I won't go as far as saying we need polar sitters, but there's some fairly advanced technology required there. But um, 360 degree observing of the sun has enabled us to look at predictability beyond what I call after the horse is bolted type paradigms. Because remember, right now, the only way no we know that the sun is going to erupt th is that it happened eight minutes ago. Okay? Just briefing you. I'm Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go into the fun bit. So what do we know? What do we know? What have we got? How can we address this real world problem? We've got measurements of solar wind sources, right? We have those in situ. We're talking about L5 missions with magnetographs to be able to observe the blind side of the sun so that when that rotates into view, we know what's going to happen. Funnily enough, the existing series of models, that's the oldest data in the system because it's that stuff that's been away from view from you for two weeks. And amazingly, the sun always seems to put new magnetic field where the old stuff was, but we can't characterize it because we've got no eye on the dark side of the sun. We all knew that the sun had a dark side. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't know how to measure BZ in a disturbance, but we do have fledgling observational techniques that can help us narrow down that coin flip too. 
the in-flight tracking thing, we have these beautiful heliospheric imagers with, with some advanced capability could be pushed to the fact where they could actually be used to trace the passage of CMEs through interplanetary space, covering that 93 million mile gap so that we can further refine, like a hurricane forecast, that window of impact, strength, arrival time. Then, assimilative model. We heard Scott Faust talking about assimilative model. When you have these structures where you can model the magnetothermal environment, this is a big mouthful, of the inner heliosphere, you could plump that into a model and run it forward to see what impact. You could get into ensemble forecasting strategy that way. And so these are all the things that we could deal with in the, in the now, this after the horse has bolted. How can we minimize the coin flips? All of those aspects can come into play. They're all at the very top end of this R to O funnel. Hopefully it won't 20, take 22 years for them to filter down or a complete magnetic activity cycle of the star to filter down to the bottom. But to get ahead of that, to go into the predictive domains like with, with terrestrial weather, I would argue very strongly that we need persistent 360 degree observations of our star's magnetic field. Uh, you know, value added to that, of course, when you're putting something out there and you overcome the technology, technical difficulties of doing that, putting a chronograph in an EUV imager is just going to be bonus eye candy. Um, I'm putting back, it's two po solar polar observatories, I see John's here. Can you help me lobby for that, John? <laughs> but I think then what you can actually do, legitimately do, is develop an assimilative model for the interior of our star. And when you develop that model, that model is the one that's going to tell you when it's going to pop and how bad that pop's going to be. So I think this is me. I remember, I'm from the research domain. <laughs> Significant investments are required in these observational and modeling strategies if we want to advance space weather forecasting capability and protect a technologically driven society. Thanks. Thank you. We would expect nothing less than research scientists to ask for more money to do research, so that's Correct. very good. <laughs> so uh, much of the, um, the burden of observing and predicting space weather falls to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administrations. Stephen Volz is the Assistant Administrator of NOAA for Satellite and, and Information Services, NESDIS. NESDIS is responsible for deploying and operating U.S. National Operational Civilian Weather and Space Weather Satellite Observing Systems. So, Steve, please. Okay, thank you, and thank you for a chance to be on this panel. Um, uh, coming last, you get to uh, cover all the points, all the questions that were left open by all the previous ones, and now all the burden of the future of space weather for forecasting from on us as well. <laughs> I, I think we, we set up this panel in this particular fashion, so we start off with the challenge. We heard about the instrumentations, the history, and from Scott here, we heard about the the research and opportunities. And um, my coming at the back end is to talk about what the operational side is and what, what, do we, what do we have and what do we expect to have and what can we hope to have. Um, so the, I would st start off with two, two points first. We've heard the example of the weather, um, the terrestrial weather analogy, space weather like terrestrial weather. And, and maybe that's a fair one, but only if you look back 50 years or thereabouts when we had the first satellite imagery, the first real thinking about global Earth weather and space weather is not too far away from that. We know what the capabilities are from having seen terrestrial weather deploy, and we hope and expect that it, we will be able to do that with space weather. But we're still a long way away from an operational system, or even from understanding what measurements are necessary for an operational system, and not disagreeing with uh, a global 360 or 360 in two axes uh, measurements, observations of the sun would be necessary. But the models and the in, in assimilation of the data in the models are necessarily, mm -hmm. are, are m immature as well. And that's the part we'll need to get to very soon. But having said that, we do have a very healthy research community, multinational, multi-agency, and operational baseline that we can use to accelerate that transition because it doesn't take us 50 years to get from where we are in terrestrial weather 50 years ago to where we are now. And on the NOAA side, as the operational arm of the weather service, the weather for, um, of the nation, we do have a long history and a forward-looking history and, and several new observatories um, in the last couple of years and looking forward. The, uh, you've heard reference to the GOES satellites, 
um, the Go 16 satellite just launched last November, and I have a couple of a chart in a minute talking about it, is part of a long tradition of 40 plus years of geostationary observations of the Earth with s instruments on the backside staring at the sun at the same time. So we have a long baseline of, of different measurements of the solar, um, the solar activity, solar imagery, and various spectra, which we use and we're extending with GOES. I'll have a chart in a minute showing which ones. DISCOVER is the, the, the Deep Space Climate Observatory launched in 2015, is out sitting out at L1. It's the first operationally ta targeted satellite that NOAA flew for space weather, the first NOAA operational satellite outside of Earth orbit. And it is a really a classic example of a research and operations. It was a research satellite designed by NASA that was stored for many years because it was the funding was cut and was put in storage. But we reactivated with NASA's help to make it a research, a research satellite now used in operational mode. It's an example of, of the, the slow, the first transition, if you will, from a research to an operational in a generation. And on the, the last one, the bottom here is the Cosmic 2A. It's a different kind of constellation of radio occultation observations, which have direct and very important Earth, obs Earth weather observational capabilities for our numerical weather models and our sounders, but also has a very good measurement of upper atmospheric disturbances and understandings of how the atmosphere responds to solar events. The combination of in all three of these are both Earth observations, but space weather as well. And what you'll see in Discover, though, is the first sort of foray into space weather by itself, standing alone as an operational platform for space weather observations. So here's, I won't go through the details on this one, but the GOES, are, GOES which is now GOES-16, in orbit now at, at geostationary over the center of the Western Hemisphere, has a whole array of instrumentation and observations of the solar disk imagery and multiple spectra, which can identify, as you can see here, the flare locations, the different spectral coverage and improvements on what we have done in the past. And it really is an example of, um, of both continuity because the 40 plus years, 43 year record from GEO and improvement as we've looked at the measurements we've taken in the past, determined through use with the research community, with the weather forecast community, space weather community, to what pieces of the observational spectrum and, uh, and instrument suite would be more, would be improved by better performance or with better, with different channels and different spectra. So it's a, a evolutionary growth as we've seen um, with the GOZAR as the first major step forward um, in the last few years, the last couple of decades for that observation. I've mentioned the Discover. Discover is a, a good example of the research to operations in a different sense. It is, it is sitting alongside, in relative terms, a few you know, 100,000 miles away probably from the NASA's ACE satellite, which was launched around 2000, now uh, almost 20 years old, from providing our sort of a buoy in space on coronal mass ejection, particle fields and magnetic fields coming from the sun during massive or any kind of solar events. Discover is continuing that operational strain um, taking over from the ACE mission that was developed by NASA and deployed over the years. And again, the measurements there are critical for an L1 observation, but also um, are, are essential then in, as the long-term data record that we want to use to inform the better applications of models, development of, of the phenomenon that Scott was talking about in some length. So from the operational perspective, what this happens for us is we have out of our National Weather Service, using again the weather model, the Space Weather Prediction Center, our SWPC, that's located up in Boulder, Colorado, which takes all of these data and data from other NASA and other international research um, observations and ground data and integrates those into a weather forecast office, which provides alerts and warnings for space weather on a 24-7 basis. And we've talked about the satellite assets here, but that 24-7, since we're not always staring at the sun, requires a global collaboration of ground systems and of data downlinks with our, when we have partners around the world to get those data to us with very low latency to provide the 24-7 updates that are required for a true weather prediction capability. And this is just a, sh a shot for some, for some color and I'll let the researchers speak more. I think um, Scott was, both Scotts have used these data much more effectively and much more often, so can talk to that. But this is just an idea and, and with this, with the GO-16 is showing these with very rapid updates, we can actually see the dynamics as they occur and zoom in with higher resolution to see the, spec the spatial um, resolution much better as well to get a much greater feel for the phenomenon that you'll be seeing. And the continuity part, which is essential to observational, operational agencies, this is the first of four satellites. GO-17 will be launched in about a year from now. And we will be providing this capability from the GO satellite, absent any changes for improvements, for at least the next 20 years. And as, as following on the 40 years previous. So that gives us that long data record 
which is an essential component of what an operational agency brings to the table. That provides one piece of it, solar imagery and some in situ measurements. What we also have realized is that one of the critical measurements that has been identified is the understanding coronal mass ejections and when they occur. And we have been using for the last 20, since 1995, a NASA European mission called SOHO for coronal mass observations, again, from the L1 location. That satellite is very old and is likely will not continue indefinitely. So we know this, we have a very specific observation gap for a, me for a critical measurement. And the same action plan that um, Bill Murtaugh mentioned identified the coronal mass ejection observation as a critical observation that needs the most immediate attention. And in our space weather forward observatory was NOAA's response to the, in, to the executive action and the biggest observational improvement or addition to the program, which is actually a series of two missions located at L1 with the intention of providing that continuity of measurements from ACE to Discover and now to Space Weather Forward Observatory and adding to it the coronal mass ejection and CME um, for compact coronagraph in for the, the next 10 years starting around 2022 or thereabouts. It's in the program and there's a step forward as, as we get ready for the initiation of that in the coming very near future. What the space weather, what the SWIFO will provide is too long, it's, it's the first step, as we said, for a dedicated space weather observatory for NOAA. Two satellites, two individual launches, sequence, sequence so that we get the continuity observations. And this has taken some time to develop and to understand, as Scott Faust was mentioning, what is the role of the NOAA as the observing lead on this? We've looked at, we have independent reviews and looked at, are there commercial options? Are there partner options? Are there other approaches to meet the, the observation demand when we are already stra strapped for funds to, uh, to address all the other observing requirements that we have? Given that criticality of the coronal mass ejection measurement, we've also looking at a potential gap mitigation attempt effort in order to, if SOHO were to fail in the very near future, we have no CME measurements. So we've been working with our NASA partner, potentially as maybe even flying on the ISS or other options, our partners with the Na um, Naval Research Lab for the compact coronagraph to pursue the highest priority observing system or observing capabilities that are in risk of loss in terms of a gap. The partnership, and, and uh, this is my last slide, that what I want to end is with, with this is we are not going to have an operational agency that's responsible and, and capable of delivering space weather, not for, a near, not for some time to come. What we really do have is a consortium, a collection of research and operations working together, national and international, as we develop, understand what are the most critical measurements to make. Um, so we're working at NOAA with NASA, with NSF on the ground that capabilities, with our partners, ESA and the Europeans also to see what satellite observations they would be interested in making as we find the best effective way to deploy assets into the future. Understanding we don't know yet, absent what you said, Scott, about the great measurements, what are the most effective ones to make operational and what still need to be research-based as you determine what are the good measurements to make. We're not ready to build the next billion dollar instrument um, because that's the one instrument that will solve all our questions. We need to understand better what the next one should be. So we're gonna be research and operations for some time to come as we get to that weather state for, the, for space weather that we are at for terrestrial weather at the present time. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Um, lots of good questions have been coming in here, but one that I guess I'd like to just pick up on what Steve was talking about and ask uh, Bill Murtaugh. Uh, from your policy perspective, how do you think the agencies are working together now and how, f how effectively can they work together in the future to accomplish the things that need to be accomplished? Yeah, so I think it's the, the, s the strategy and the action plan when they were introduced one of the key things we had, we had to put together the task force, and the task force was called a SWARM, good acronym, the SWARM Task Space Weather Operations Research and Mitigation Task Force, and it was quite unique because it was the it was the, the merging or bringing together of the science community of NASA, NOAA, NSF, the DoD Research Lab, with the preparedness community, FEMA, DHS, DOE, and of course DoD elements. And that uh, the executive order then mandated that activity, and it now resides within the National Science and Technology Council in the White House. And that's uh, the NSTC is there just uh, essentially for to ensure good consistency and continuity across changes in administration. So we've uh, we embarked on the implementation of the action plan over a year ago. We've made very good progress. 
and uh, we were very pleased quite recently working with the new administration uh, who advised us to proceed as we, ha as we have been working on this uh, effort and in fact we'll be meeting at the uh, White House in May at the next SWARM meeting to continue implementation of this action plan. So I've, I, I think I've been uh, very, very satisfied yes. down with what I've seen with the, with the partnership, the interaction between uh, all the agencies uh, working on, on these actions. A question from the audience was, uh, and it was raised by Scott, about uh, has the quiet sun, the relatively quiet sun that we've seen, uh, is that making it more difficult to get decision makers interested in the issue of space weather? I guess I'd be interested in the perspective of anyone here. Crisp answers to this very complicated question, maybe. Anyone want to take that? Uh, well, maybe I'll say Yeah, you can you, you say have something. that perspective. Yeah. And, and I think Scott touched on it anyway. Yes. A anytime, I mean, edu it's such a huge part of our responsibility is educating the decision makers in, inside the White House, in, in, on the Hill, et cetera, on these issues. And the one thing we pound in time and time again, and we have lots of graphs and plots to show it, is that these space weather events and some of the big ones that have occurred in the past will occur unexpectedly, sometimes right in the middle of solar minimum. And that seems to resonate. I think we've had considerable success. I've, pe I've heard people repeat that very fact, don't ever let your guard down. We often don't talk about the solar cycle anymore because it is a little bit misleading. Some would, su some would expect that that maximum of activities on the 11-year cycle is when we should see things and then the minimum, we let our guard down with nothing to worry about for years, not the case. We've made that uh, we've made that argument time and time again, and I think with uh, considerable success. But we have to keep doing it. Every change in administration, every change in Congress, we still have to continue that education process. Sure. Anyone else want to? Yeah, because even even in quiet times, there's these other phenomena called coronal holes, holes in the tree. Could Steve in, in Steve's presentation, big dark patches on the sun, you know, to contrast with the bright shiny things that give rise to the frozen CME. Those dark patches on the sun give rise to very high speed wind streams that also have a damaging effect. And as much as the active regions and sunspots dominate the solar cycle, when the solar so when the active regions and sunspots go away, the coronal holes actually increase in number. And so the, the heliosphere itself is like Swiss cheese. The solar system is full of these holes. And all of those holes and the interactions within those holes drives a lot of energetic effects in the upper atmosphere. In fact, most of the very frequent auroral episodes that we're having right now are all driven by the solar wind and not by flares and CME. So we're entering a phase where that will be the prevalent, prevalent mode of activity. Yes. Another question from the audience was, how do we incentivize private industry to play a bigger role in space weather and space weather observation? So maybe Scott could take that and maybe Steve would also like to. <coughs> well, I, I think part of our incentive right now is just uh, as certainly our R&D group is that the intense passion in um, kind of certainly viewing the understanding of the sun as one of the kind of you know, great interesting technical frontiers. And, um, I think this question though, it's, you know, if we're going to get serious about starting to prepare to, to build these instruments. You know, I think it's going to know that, that the plan's actionable, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the fact that, that there is a strategy, there's an action plan. Yeah. That actually, we've already seen it inside of Lockheed. It's a, there's been a uh, Lockheed Martin. There's been a, re we've really stood up to a lot more interest. And I think, so my sense is that uh, Bill's uh, strategy, getting that out there and half the audience mm -hmm. has seen it, is, uh, ha has had its impact. I'm sure the other half of the audience will go out and look at this right <laughs> away, so it'll be 100% uh, soon. So, Steve, would you I like can add to that. Um, sort of in a dark humor way, we could say we're just one major catastrophe away from a fully funded program. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it is true that fear sells, and an event that gets people, wakes people up, in usually in a negative way because there's damage and impact, is what gets people's attention. Um, but I think this is a great example where the weather history can help us, and it goes back to what Bill Murtaugh was saying about education. The weather history can help us, and it's not just prevention of bad things, which is why we do observations and forecasts. Um, that's why we do forecasts, so you can prepare and plan, and plan to make benefits, make, make profits, to, to, to use it more effectively. On the space weather side, 
the understanding the dynamics of the Earth's atmosphere and how it affects GPS and GPS signals, for example, it would be really useful for industry to realize how they can take advantage of that to make better examples of how to use and how to position their GPS towers or their, or their you know, remote control observations. And so there are, there are a number of ways that Earth observation data that are forecast for weather are used by economic, by s industry, right. and by the community for, for more efficient operations of their services. And space weather should not be any different from that. And to the degree that what we're doing now is to uh, understanding the impact of space weather, it goes both ways. The impact is, is both negative if it's a storm, but it can be positive and better in case of better understanding of how it affects our services so that we can uh, mitigate and prepare and, uh, and work around those events. Your remark reminds me that uh, something we say, and it's very true, is that it's not a question of if one of these large events is going to occur, it's a question of when. And uh, I think that's what is really our, our challenge, is to understand when and to be as prepared as we can be. Another question from the audience was, could someone describe a little more the pipeline from the beautiful basic research that we're capable of doing now with both satellites in, in uh, space and uh, ground-based facilities like the Daniel K. In a way, telescope that's coming online. But how do we go from the basic research to the operational kind of uh, realm that we need to, uh, to have. And uh, I don't know whether anybody would like to field that question, talk more about the pipeline. You can start at the funnel, so. <laughs> yeah, the, at, at, the, at the meaty end of the funnel. Um, you know, I think is for us, it's like, as Jim said, as Steve said it, we have to eliminate false positives. And there's a large impetus in, in the research community to figure out what are the best measurements to make. It would be great if we had a tech demonstrator line to be able to kind of eliminate, eliminate those things. But I think, you know, from our perspective, it's about innovating in technology, innovating and trying to get ideas out there. It's not always straightforward. We ha also have to meet some of the requirements of our um, partners in the observation or the operational domain. They have real needs. They don't just want people off chasing unicorns. They have a real need for that measurement. And so some of the things that we're looking at in terms of order or research and operations pipelines, at least from an observational perspective, will be value added things. So we'll give them the kind of high heritage measurement in a, d in a way that we can also leverage innovative stuff that eventually we would hope percolates further down the funnel to, mm -hmm. to your end. And from the operational end is uh, agreeing with that is that what we'd like to see is that the measurement we make has an impact. And there's a, there, it's more important than another measurement because we can't afford to do two or three at a time. So the maturation of the models and the way that the data influences the model outputs is gonna be a very key piece of it um, at this point. But uh, that said, the solar, the space weather measurement instruments, are n these are not space telescopes we're building that are uh, the size of a football field. They're in situ mm -hmm. measurements relatively simple and small ones that haven't been flown before may reveal capabil capabilities and understandings that we are not aware of. So the need for companion instruments, demonstration instruments, short flight durations to understand the impact of certain measurements on models and understanding are, are really key. And, and um, from the, uh, <coughs> that's why I say the collaborations between the operational agency, NOAA in this case, but with the Air Force Research Labs and with um, with NASA and their research are really key in getting some of these demonstration instruments to space. Some of the questions suggest uh, sort of either or, which should take priority systems to support operational forecasting or instruments to make better research measurements. I don't think it's one or the other, but would anyone like to talk about what the priorities at this point really ought to be? I, if I ask Scott, <laughs> I, I think I know the answer. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's I know. value added science. <laughs> there, okay, there you okay. go. Okay. I'll just make a, a comment on that and taking off my policy hat and putting on my operations hat, which is my other job in an earlier life as a space weather forecaster at the space in the operations center uh, in Boulder. And when Scott put up that list, the, 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 the holy grail list of, of things we don't understand in the science of space weather, that certainly resonated with me because it was so difficult sitting on the desk in the forecast office, seeing the eruption occur on the sun and have the airlines, United or American Airlines, call me and say, Bill, how come you didn't give us a heads up that was about to occur? 
And the answer, of course, was because we could not. The science <laughs> was not there. Yeah. And then that big so coronal mass ejection leaves the sun and hits the Earth 25 so hours later, and we get a huge disturbance. We weren't expecting it to be so huge. And the power grid guy said, Bill, why didn't you tell us it was going to be like this? And he said, because we couldn't. The <laughs> science wasn't there. So, uh, uh, you know, obviously we need that baseline core of observational instruments to satisfy the alerts and warnings that we are required to issue, but there are so many gaps right now in our ability to predict this stuff. I, uh, so I fully support the research activities uh, to hopefully get us there someday, and so much of the strategy and the action plan call out specific activities to try to do that to to, to move the process forward, may it be the research to operations process, Dan, on that yeah. question about the pipeline, the research right. to operations plan was just released from the Federal Register because it was recognized as a big problem in the community. And uh, we got a lot of great feedback and are working on that now to present to OMB and to the Hill a, a structure to improve that, uh, that process and ability to get that research that's so, so necessary into the operation centers. Are we as researchers, um, as uh, indus interested industry, um, are we telling our story effectively to policymakers, to Congress and so forth? I mean, uh, that, that's a gist of a question I think that came from the audience. Again, Bill, I mean, yeah. you, you've been in, inside the Beltway uh, 26 months on your six month assignment. Yeah, I, I, I think, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's another story, but <laughs> I, I, I think we have been yeah, effective. I mean, obviously, the strategy, the action plan, the Senate Bill 141, all address was all uh, certainly steps in that that direction. Right. But but the key, and I can't emphasize it enough, is to that it must be sustained. That we must continue that. We've got new people coming and going all the time, and the head, the agency leadership, and on the Hill, our elected officials. Uh, so I think um, we're, we, we've done quite well recently. We, we've certainly elevated this issue to a point where people inside the White House and on the Hill have taken action. Mm -hmm. So that was the goal. Uh, but we must uh, continue to, to do to sustain <coughs> it. Thanks, Scott. So my, my perspective on that is that, you know, many times you try to raise this to the policy and it becomes kind of an emotional decision. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's so critically important for the community to start to come together and use these models. Because if you can actually start to get a, a strong approach to developing these models and using those to create the data in a very consistent way, I think we'll be much better off. And so therefore, you start having true fact-based discussions yeah. as opposed to kind of these things that can quickly become emotional. Yeah. Steve, I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you see the agencies working together now and, and into the future? What What's the key in your mind? So I'll pick that, but I'd like to answer your uh, earlier oh, question sure. first. Uh, have any have the that. we collectively been effective? And yes. I'll take exception to uh, bills. I say no. I think um, the strident and co coordinated voice of scientists and researchers who say that this is an essential measure we must make is not sufficient to move the needle on getting a congressional or administra you know, administration support for a program like this. I think what is necessary as well, going back to the weather example, is the user community that is impacted by the product that we will produce has to recognize that and support it as well. So there, what is just as effective as a, a compelling science model of how the sun generates CMEs is a compelling economic model of how the airline industry is going to react and how the utility industry is, needs this data and will be, and perform to it and is already executing plans based on on what we tell them. So I think the we need we need to do a good job of showing that we're providing a service that is impactful and used as opposed to something that is useful if somebody decides they're going to use it. So we have to be we, we can't lead from in front of the people who yeah. are going to be using our products. And I think that is uh, from the weather side that has been uh, indicated if you can show how the data are used then it's much more effective with our, our community. We literally just have a couple of minutes left. If, if each one of you could give your 45 second elevator speech about space weather, I'd like to uh, hear that, starting with Steve and we'll okay, go Okay, thank down. you. Um, I, I started, a, I'll, I'll credit the first 30 seconds of what I just said, but the, um, the other part, I think this is a research and operations activity. I think we do have a baseline. There are measurements we know are important and they're allowing us to understand the system better. And, but there are measurements we don't know what we need to take yet, and we need to work hand in glove with the researchers 
with the research agencies to have an effective, a, a productive way to learn how to create the, the observing system that we really need. Thank you, Scott. And from my perspective, um, we need to learn from our operational partners and we need to think about the terrestrial meteorology community and how best, how most effectively we can close that 60 year gap. Thank you, Scott. <coughs> well, I personally think it's gonna be an exciting time over the next 10 years in terms of w w the progress we'll see in this area and I'm looking forward in to seeing the research community, the operational community, and most importantly, as Steve talked about, the end user community coming together. Thank you. Bill. Yeah, just to piggyback on a bit on what Steve finished on there, the, uh, and I emphasized this already, this, this sustained engagement. And yes, we, we do it across the, the federal government now and work in the strategy and action plan. But yes, we, we work very closely with, with industry, whether it's the space indus industry, satellite industry, power grid, or the aviation community. But it's, yes, it's, it's indeed, of course, very important for the folks on the Hill especially to hear from those folks the importance of this information. For Bill Mercer to walk in there and tell how important the space weather is, uh, yeah, that's fine, it's good, it's somewhat compelling, but you have somebody operating the uh, power grid in Washington DC or Con Ed in New York City telling them folks what they uh, need to be, what we need to be worried about, then we get traction. And I sincerely hope that national security space and civilian space will work hand in glove uh, to address these problems. This is something that affects uh, all of us and uh, all we do and uh, the rest of the world. And uh, an extreme event, as was discussed here, could be a, a rude awakening for everyone. I hope it doesn't come to that before we are prepared and become a space weather ready nation. So thank you. Great. Thank you all for your attention. Great. And thank you so much, Dr. Baker and the rest of the panelists here. A uh, fascinating look at a very interesting topic. So thank you all so much for your insights. We'll get a quick round of applause here. Thank you. Thank you. And as our uh, panelists exit the stage, I'd like to uh, call up our next panel.